Welcome back to Deep Thoughts, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being patient with my movie reviews. I think these movies are extremely important. I think it will affect your life if you see them. It'll make you a better person. It'll make you more enlightened. Uh, the only, again, couple movies I think I covered that have no bearing like that is Tron and Blade Runner. But I have background information on those movies that maybe is in a book at best. But everything else, all good. But today, I want to talk about The Matrix again. The reason why I want to talk about The Matrix is several fold, but one of the big reasons is, is that I, I have now, probably since the last time I talked about The Matrix, which may have even been a year ago, and we've done several, right? The average person talks about The Matrix now. I was at a grocery store, and I don't know what funny thing happened at the uh, checkout part, but I made a joke about The Matrix, and two girls, probably between 18 and 25, just looked at me and was like, totally, right? You know, we're, we're definitely living in The Matrix. Um, another woman, probably in her 40s or 50s, same situation, boom. Oh yeah, we're definitely living in a matrix. So I want to, I want to come at this from several different angles. One of which I think has to do with strictly, we are being so gaslit in this world, meaning told lies that are being presented as truths, that it's becoming exceptionally difficult for us to uh, piece it all together a lot. And it's getting us exhausted too. And so all the shenanigans in the world are making us, the fact, the more that you, you dial into them, you more, you just get exhausted. And so what happens when you get exhausted? It goes to that old saying, if you can't beat them, join them. You simply have no more energy to fight all that uh, inside your own mind and so you tend to give up on the most extraneous ones first, the less priority ones in your life, and you start to focus on the ones you think are mega important, but you're already out of gas. And the danger of this whole process is, is that you have to take care of number one. Like I've always said for nine years, you have a sphere of influence, which is your reality distortion field. It's where you have the most manifest power to get out of your life what you need what you need before you even get to what you want. And so when they exhaust you from the outside in, you get to yourself and you're just powerless. If you, if you do this to extremes, you'll be powerless to handle the most basic requirements that your life needs. And if you're married and you have children, think about all the impact that's going to trickle down to them. You won't be a good mother. You won't be a good father. You won't be a good person. I don't mean you're going to go commit sin and, and hurt people, but you're just, you're just afraid not. You're the end of the rope that's just blech, right? No substance, no use. What could you ever use the end of a frayed rope? That's what I should have said, rope. But what would you use the end of a frayed rope to do besides tickle somebody? That'd be it. You know, it has no rope in it, but that it's a rope. You are a human being. So coming at this from a... Um, Perspective of the Matrix. Now, if you're new, we have parsed the Matrix from so many different levels. Obviously, probably an infinite level of, of perspectives aren't covered because there are several different ways to view this. But what is causing us to doubt our reality? Well, there's several different movements around the world that may or may not be organic. They might have been started by intelligence agencies. Who knows? You have the Flat Earth Movement. You have the Mandela Effect. You have uh, curiosities about, does space even exist? I mean, we know we, you, you can't deny when you look up, you see a bed of stars. That, that's definitely coming down on us, right? For those of you who believe in manifest uh, or, or consensus reality, excuse me, I have a whole episode on that. What if this whole thing is just man's global uh, 
average mean perception of reality. And as agencies of men have put together a belief system about where we are, we grab a hold of that and it simply becomes that. What if the earth was flat at one point and then it became round, right? What if all this Mandela effect stuff is nothing more than consensus reality kind of sorting itself out because the internet's kind of gotten to that level of magnitude where we can hear what another sector of the world believes. And so we concede. But we call it the matrix in the truth movement, don't we? But there's a lot of articles that go back probably at least 40 years, maybe 50. Science fiction novels, probably 80 years where, you know, there's some sort of sense that we're in a computer reality. The first movie that insinuated that human beings could, or a human being, uh, Kevin Flynn, the fictional character, went inside of a computer, was released in August of 1982. And we got to see some version, some visual metaphor of what it would be like to be inside of a computer, but television all through the 80s with all kinds of different productions and especially the 90s, it just took off. Living in a computer became a part of a role-playing game called Shadowrun where people sat down and really thought it out. I don't personally believe that it is important for us to distinguish whether or not we're in a reality and to also know exactly how the computer works or how it would hold the, the, this reality together right? It's, it could definitely be, I mean, like we're, we're in some form of life right now in the universe, right? But we don't really know how it's, uh, how it's shaped and how everything works. We have a pretty good idea if you get into ethereal sciences, how the physics might work for everything. Again, once you go ethereal theory, the unified theory of the universe at, just immediately shows up. The more you know about physics, the more you know about different disciplines from you know, fluid dynamics all the way to subatomic physics, it all makes sense, 100%. It's a pressure system. The universe that we're in is most likely a bubble, which creates the container, which contains the pressure. But there's also probably infinite fractals of other bubbles. Whether or not they go down into our fingernails and we have more universes down inside there, eh, potentially. But it's not important, is it? Why do we care if we're in a matrix? What's the big benefit if we do figure it out, right? I think that we can easily say that because of the internet, and it depends on how old you are, the internet had some pretty amazing information from 95, I would say, to 2005. Once they started realizing that by 2005, when a little movie came out called Loose Change, which questioned everything that happened in September 2001, they realized the threat. That's why Zygmunt Brzezinski is giving a, a speech, I believe, in New York to a pretty small crowd in a pretty small theater, and he's literally saying, we got to shut this thing down because it is revealing our secret plans for Agenda 21 without saying it on point. And so then they're like, okay, we are not going to be able to censor reality down. That's just never going to be something they can do quick enough. Of course, they're trying to do it today. And you have to fight it every step of the way. You do. So they decided to go with the gaslighting technique, telling you so many truths mixed with lies, right? 80% truth, 20% lie. If you have a concept you're being sold in the universe, uh, well, on planet Earth, I guess, and you're getting 80% truth and 20% lies, you're going to end up losing. It's sort of like the odds in Vegas. I have been, because of video game creation, I've been in very close to people that know everything about everything in Vegas, every single game, slot machines, every tabletop game, card game. And they, it all boiled down after about 10 years of, of doing this work in that industry off and on. They said, look, if the casino has 51% odds to beat you, they're going to take all your money. Think about that. 1% over a 50-50 chance and they get all your money in the end. 
But the idea is that almost all games, besides something like poker, where it's a talent talent based game, it's not really gambling. All other games, their odds are way, way less uh, in terms of your winning percentage being 49%. Some were as bad as, you know, 21%. So you're definitely there just to have fun and lose your money and hopefully have a good time, right? But what's driving us? Well, there's a million ways to answer that question as well. One, we, we seek the truth, right? One of the things that seems to be embedded, well, there's two major things embedded in mankind, I think in all living creatures, but most definitely mankind. One, all living creatures desire freedom. All living creatures desire that. Take a mouse and put him in a shoebox and see if he doesn't try to get out. Take a spider, put him in a shoebox, see if he doesn't try to get out. Freedom. Nobody wants to be stuck in some same location. We're pattern-based creatures, and when you're trapped, the patterns lock up real fast. Which gets us to the second quality of, I think, of most living beings, which is curiosity. They want to figure stuff out. Curiosity is how beings evolve, mentally especially, right? What's over there? I don't know. Let's go see. Okay. Ooh. One of us got eaten by a weird being we've never even seen before. Let's call that a tiger. Okay. And if we see those things, we got to figure out how they move and where they live. And maybe they're going to chase us home. We got to figure out how to defend ourselves. Evolution. But there's still mystery after mystery after mystery, isn't there? You and I can't just get in a spaceship and go up 80 miles to see what's there. Because at 80 miles, guarantee, with the rods and cones in a human mind, we would definitely see curvature on the earth if we could get that high. But we can't. So we have to take other agencies, you know, proof, I guess, you know, their, their claims. Space in general. Well, even if we could get to 250 miles up where space stations are supposed to exist and satellites are up there, even geocentric orbit, we're still not leaving Earth's orbit. So how do we get to the sparkly things in the sky to get a perspective of what the hell they are? We have been told what they are. But how many other things have we been told were true and were held for hundreds of years only to be probably debunked through logic? The earth being on the back of a turtle, you know, and the old question goes, what's the turtle standing on? Of which people at the time said, turtles all the way down. Doesn't make any sense. Okay. We have human beings on this planet that have all the distinctive features of a human being, but when they interact with us, they seem like they're NPCs. Some of them are well articulated. Some of them seem like they're devoid of any consciousness whatsoever. We're, ta we're starting to call them NPCs after the non-player characters in video games, the ones that sit around and give quests. They're not being controlled by a human. They're, they're scripted to say things. It's a little more odd when they turn into human beings if they do exist because they are able to interact with us, but they're sort of like a, a Westworld android that has a program. It only does the one thing. It's the prostitute that's supposed to take you upstairs and make you happy. It's the guy that takes you off on a treasure hunt. It's someone else doing something very basic, serving you a drink at a bar or a saloon. That's all they do. But when they do it, they do it well. And if you ask them any questions relative to the space that they're in, they've got all the answers. But they're not able to leave Westworld, right? And so we have human beings that have this characteristic. We wonder how certain human beings can backstab society in so many different ways. It seems as the power structure goes up and up and up, we simply cease to be able to understand what's going on in the minds of those that are in control. Because the second you can itemize any person who's in one of these coveted secret families that seem to operate uh, completely outside the law, they have inexhaustible money on a level that is truly infinite. So they, they never need money. They never need resources. But they are involved over and over and over again in the most heinous 
violations of human rights that we know of on planet Earth. There is nothing you can conceive of that they don't appear to do as a regiment on a daily basis. For those of you who ever seen the movie Time Bandits, of which I will not cover, but I love this movie, it's made by Terry Gilliam out of Monty Python. Terry Gilliam was the animator during the 70s and all the movies that they ever made in the 80s. He turned out to be an amazing director. He made Brazil. He made Time Bandits with David Warner playing uh, pretty much the devil. But it's about a bunch of characters who steal the essentially the map of God's universe in that they know where to be at a certain particular time on Earth's surface where this door opens up and they can jump through it and they fall into a different timetable on Earth. So they could go from the caveman era to Napoleon's era back to the Civil War, et cetera, et cetera. And it's them on this crazy hunt to steal a bunch of treasure. It's a comedy, right? But that's sort of a Matrix concept. And eventually God comes to get his map. And it's really endearing. We have the movie The Matrix released in 1999 where Neo's birthday is September 11th, 2001, on his ID. That's really suspect, isn't it? But that's showing you an absolute, literal definition of being inside of an AI-simulated world. It's sort of like ours. It's definitely got its ups and downs, but for the most part, it's our world. And then, of course, Morpheus comes to get him. They pull him out, and you find out that it was a complete facade inside this computer. And he's pulled out and rehabilitated, and there's a war on to bring back real humanity, the real world. I'm just going to throw a few of these out there so we kind of warm up the palette. You know, if we were a painter, we'd have a palette with our thumb through it, right? It has a spectrum of colors on it. We're putting the paint on the palette right now. What other weird Matrix things are out there? Well, you've got one that's uh, predictive programming extreme, which is called The Simpsons. Now South Park's getting pretty good at it. And again, we have to temper ourselves with things like, you know, The Simpsons. If agencies are putting future plans into cartoon episodes, there's nothing magical about that. They're just pre-programming us for predictive programming, right? They're showing us eventualities that when they occur, although normally debilitating and might cause civil unrest, we are somehow subliminally warmed up to it so that we don't go off the scale and they control society, but they also get the change, the order out of chaos that they're looking for, right? Problem, reaction, solution. Any old book, any old passage that's written down before today that predicts anything, if they so choose to implement that thing, it doesn't become magical, right? You could have had uh, Nostradamus, let's just say everything that they fabled that guy to say, right, was written down by him. They could easily, no, I shouldn't say easily, but with their money and their power and their organization, they can make anything that he said come true in the future, thus making you think that there's some magical fabric to the universe where he's seeing something, right? For myself, uh, one of the weird things about reality is that I've had, and for the OG listeners, I apologize for saying this one more time, but I just want to illustrate, I do have at least two major experiences in my life where I predicted the future, either a second before it happened in a very complex way, where one was I was 11 years old. I walked into a kitchen. This woman, who's my dad's best friend's wife, is making macaroni and cheese. And she says, do you want any macaroni and cheese? And I start blacking out as soon as I go into this kitchen. Like purple vision. And I put my hand, my left hand on my head. I was like, whoa. And she says, are you all right? And I get this total vision. I point at the door that's attached to the kitchen outside. And I said, someone's going to be at that door and they're going to be hurt. Put a beat in the script. The door starts pounding. It's her five-year-old son that had been bitten on the stomach by the, uh, the, 
family beagle, which the kid was always abusing that beagle because he was a little child. But he had to go to the hospital and get stitches. That's how serious this injury was, right? And then the night before 9-11, I told my girlfriend at the time, I said, I feel like something bad's going to happen. It's going to involve planes. And then I saw two planes pass over my head uh, on a white ceiling. Well, the next morning, you know, 9-11 happens, right? Uh, Philip K. Dick, who wrote Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, which then turned into Blade Runner. He has a couple of these. One where he envisioned... uh, he got a spark in his eye and literally, and he had a crystal hanging in his window. And all of a sudden he saw a tangle in his son, who's about one year old, a tangle in his gut that was going to kill him. And so he runs into the kitchen, grabs his kid who's being fed by his wife. He goes, we have to go to the hospital right now. They rush to the hospital. He explains it all to the doctor. They op- they scan that kid with an ultrasound and they're like, you know, they come back into him. They go, okay, well, your son's wasn't in any immediate danger, but you're right. That thing is all twisted up. We're going to have to go in and unwind that. It'll be really easy surgery for him. Won't be a big deal. Barely have a mark. But they asked him, they said, how do you know all this? How did you know that was there? Are you a doctor? You told us all of the anatomy pieces and parts inside your son's gut. And he just said, well, I just had a vision. So with those experiences, if you even have one of those experiences, you're starting to see time much different than most conventional schools will teach you, right? Because everything's just normal and basic. Are these two things related? Are, is the ability for a human being to feel time coming, right, the same thing as a matrix? I would say actually probably not. Now think about... The Matrix from the movie. Think about Neo never being found by Trinity. And he just lives inside that computer like everybody else was living. All right, so he's in the Matrix. He's living this life. You still seem to be born, live, and die. And I don't know how they were handling reincarnation, but think about it. If you're still a human in this pod generating the human electricity on nano, what was it, uh, milliamps, right, which is being harvested in the billions and trillions, right? Reincarnation would make complete sense because you, you didn't die in the pod necessarily. You were just having your experience in the matrix. And, you know, the, the other big question when you start talking about a computer of any kind, the physical life of a being might far out exceed any microprocessor capability of or or its its megahertz to portray a life to you. What I mean by that is this: What if inside of a computer you could live a full life in five seconds? So it's five thousand milliseconds. But your body's going to live, especially because it's in this container. And I'm not saying this is real, but if your body was well taken care of on the outside of the computer, you might live 80 to 100 years or 200 years. Who knows? You're definitely not going to get injured. If they fed you a perfect, perfect nutritional supplement, not any of this GMO crap and all these shots they give you, then you're going to be fine. And you're going to live this massive long life. So every five seconds, I'm just making that up, you're having a full life like Picard in Star Trek, who went off and lived an entire life in 20 minutes or something like that. I think that, you know, if you were to take 100% and divide it into every single reason that people are interested in the matrix and and there's, you you could be in two different different, uh, metrics in that. I think that the overwhelming biggest pie slice in this pie chart, whatever that percentage is, is simply individuals seeking the truth about where they are. They're not seeking superpowers. They just want to know, what am I doing here? Where am I? Who's God? Who is God, right? When you start thinking about the matrix, what's very interesting, and if you believe any statement ever said about it, and and one of the most incredible stories I ever heard that I just think about every single time I think about the matrix, and I mean without deviation, is a woman 
who I believe in 1954, she died as a child. She was in a car crash. She goes to the afterlife. And this is 54, all right? There's no computers. There's no flat screen things. There's no backlit, backlit keyboards. There's none of that stuff, right? Governments had computers in the back door, and they were as big as buildings, right? I'm not even sure what tape backups they had in 54. We definitely had reel-to-reels by that time, but... Man, that stuff was brand new. Television stations in England still had wire drives, right? This girl comes back and documented by the doctors of the time, documented by her parents. This isn't some, you know, Johnny Come Lately story. Oh, I remember now, you know, and I'm 90 years old and I'm going to use modern day technology to put it into my story to seem like I'm special. Back in 54, she said that she woke up in this place. And that an older gentleman came to her, very friendly, and offered his hand. She grabbed his hand like any child would do, and especially in, a, in an environment where you're scared. I'm eight years old, and you're a little girl. And he said, uh, come with me. To some degree, he said the classic line that everybody goes the other side, always hears from somebody. It's not your time. It's the most common thing. Hundreds of people who have been on the other side say that this is the line that they hear. Now, this is 54, so she hadn't, she hadn't heard stories about people going the other side and hearing that story, and then she was repeating it because she heard it from someplace else. This is this beautiful about this is 1954. But what she ends up describing to the adults when she woke back up is nothing shy of Westworld. An office where compartments were separated with glass walls, which did exist in 54, but inside, without knowing how to say computer, she said, essentially, if you translate what she was saying, she says that they were looking at flat panel displays and typing on these, these little boxes where the, the keys were actually lit. And it was one group after another, one person after another in these little cubes, and no one said anything to her except the man. And he took her down a hallway and said it wasn't her time. You got to go back down. So think about that for a second. A lot of us believe in God. Some don't. I respect that. However you got there. But for a lot of us, you know, the way the saying goes is if, you're, uh, if you don't know much about the world, you believe in God. You learn a little bit of science and you cease to believe in God. And then you learn a lot of science and boy, you find God again. You find him at a level that there's no more faith anymore. You believe. And that's a very interesting transformation from a, a simpler mind has to use faith to believe in God. The atheist shows up inside science. And a lot of people never, ever cross the atheist barrier. But then when you get to this supreme knowledge of science, you get to a point where there's no more faith. God is an absolute. You don't know who God is but you believe in it. But if you have a matrix that is sort of like a Westworld matrix matrix and there's humans involved or, you know, like the movie, a renegade collection of AIs that has taken what is probably a man-made construct and maintained it, all the humans that made it has never been explained. I just saw Matrix 4 and what a joke that movie is. Oh my gosh, it was absolutely awful. It had an opportunity to pierce the veil of where did the matrix come from? And it just walked, just didn't go in that direction whatsoever, right? But what if you had a medium between you and God that is really creating the reality that you're in? God creates the whole thing. And under that is this other thing, the matrix. And we're inside that. It's like the Russian doll thing, right? If you believe in aliens in a really extreme way and you've spent a lot of time researching aliens, you might think, well, okay, what if Earth, flat, round, whatever, is a Petri dish and we're being observed and they're just watching how life comes about? Now, as I've said in several episodes, if that were the case, what's odd about that is that we must be the very first experiment they've ever done, or we're in the first thousand experiments or whatever, because if aliens, 
we're at this supreme level of capability of creating a dome or creating some sort of earth, whatever shape it is, and putting us on there, there wouldn't be any unsolved mysteries after 100,000 years of watching man, a million years. So if these alien beings were like 10 million years old, there wouldn't be any more questions to answer really. So what would be the point of putting us in there besides they love us or something and they're just putting in this putting us in this container to protect us or something like that? I don't think there'd be any observational benefits in their little book of how creatures evolve. See, there were one of the very first groups to do this, or it's not that, or it's something else. I mean, the purpose of it would be something else. So human beings are getting to, I should say it differently, human beings have invented, discovered, quantum computing. I have a whole episode on quantum computing, in case you don't know what a quantum computer is. It's exhaustive, and I make it very easy for you to understand what it is. But essentially, it's a computer that uses spinning atoms to create numbers inside of a processing system that are then pushed into equations such that every possibility that an equation could possibly yield is known all at once. So instead of walking into a maze with a an AI that looks around inside the maze and constantly bumps into all the walls, you know, the no-go paths till it finds either the escape route or the center of the maze. A quantum computer just goes, here are the exits, here are the centerpieces, the center, you know, points of interest, right? It has been said that if they could stabilize 50 qubits, and, and you need to understand this technology isn't, at least to our knowledge, completely stabilized. So it's about 5% error rate, and they're trying to use big machine learning to, to shave off that 5% a little bit, but still guessing. But if we could ever stabilize those things to a fraction of a percent, you now have a computer that could easily conceive of every single atomic uh, quantum that creates the world that we're in. Flat, round, doesn't matter. All of the particles that create the weather could be conceived of and then predicted because the computer would just say, this cloud is going to turn exactly this way and there's going to be a tornado. And it knows the butterfly effect from every, every single conceivable vector, right? So you move this and it changes that. You move that, it changes this. They just know. It's like the bistro in uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, if you've ever read that book series. Now, when you're thinking about a computer that could create this reality, 50 qubits can do it. However, as far as I understand the technology, adding more qubits is not, it, it doesn't increase the complexity much for the computing power of these systems. Yes, you have to scale some other things, but it's pretty mathematical. It's not like taking a Bugatti and saying, okay, we want to create a Bugatti that goes from 200 miles an hour to 300 miles an hour, and you 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 can't do it because the engine would be so big, it becomes as big as a rocket, right? The reason why I mention that is this. They said that at 300 qubits, for every single model we've ever theorized about the universe, and I understand if you guys don't believe any of those, I question that myself, this computer could conceive of the universe conceive of it. We don't know where everything is in the universe, so it would be extremely inaccurate. But it could conceive of every galaxy, every everything everywhere until we reach the edge of this probably sphere that is the ethereal barrier of our particular pressurized container. Whew, now that's huge. If you think about it, it doesn't need that. Go to the Matrix movie with Keanu Reeves. It was just simulating Earth. No matter what shape it is, every planet, I'm sorry, every city, excuse me, that we've ever been to, created, conceived of, and every nook and cranny, every jungle, every undiscovered Peruvian Indian or, or um, New Guinea tribe, it's in there without a problem. The only thing we were missing in the above ground technology was the AI to be these people. Now, here's the rub. 
we talk about NPCs being sort of partially programmed human beings. It could be seriously uh, an academic defect. It could be a genetic defect. It could be drug abuse, food abuse, medicine abuse that gets these people to, to be nonsensical to the point where they really don't contribute to society much, right? But we're not prepared for the following statement, that we are AIs ourselves. We don't like that because that seems to take away free will. But if you want to entertain any form of matrix, well, you're going to have to uh, keep that as an option. Obviously, if we are some sort of AI program, then we're pretty amazing, right? But I said in a previous episode, I don't remember which one, but I was talking about Freud. And I know that people love calling Freud a kook and, and that his theories were completely antiquated. I've read a lot about Freud in my lifetime, but I will say the three things that I think he has correct, and this is probably articulated several times before he was even born in so many different ways. I mean, I would imagine a Native American tribe telling their, their kids this kind of stuff somehow, which is we have three layers to our onion. The outer layer is your persona. You have several personas. You talk to old people with one persona. You talk to your friends in another persona. You talk to your parents in a different persona. If you're a professional that stands on stage, like perhaps Steve Jobs, you have a different persona. You're talking and adjusting how you talk to get along and to communicate effectively with that group of people and to preserve their perception of you. You may swear like a sailor, but you talk to an old woman and boy, you keep your, you keep your vocabulary very clean. She thinks you're an angel, right? Then one layer down, you have your character and that's who you really are. That's you in the bathroom in the morning looking in the mirror. That's you in the shower having a conversation with yourself. That's you in your car having a conversation with yourself. It's who you really are. But then Freud talked about the id. One of the best examples of the id is the 1956 movie Forbidden Planet with uh, Leslie Nielsen from Naked Gun. It played a serious role. It's kind of cool. It's where Star Trek came from. Gene Roddenberry took that movie and made Star Trek. The id is that internal furnace of undisciplined, chaotic thought. It is this wild furnace, which is also symbolized in the movie uh, Forbidden Planet. We can't control it. We'd love to control it, but we never, ever will. And it's almost the singularity idea of all of the AI coming down to a crushing point where logic doesn't make any sense anymore. You're having every single thought rolled around inside that thing. And it pops out some gems every once in a while, right? If you're a creative person and you draw, or you write music or you write stories, that's usually sort of like um, an apex of your ability to create, but it also creates chaos. It creates suspicion. It creates hatred. It creates all these things you don't have anything to do with doubt, right? And what you end up doing, I will tell you, as you get older, if you're aware of that dynamic, the id, the character, and the persona, is one, you'll try to merge your character and your persona together to be the most genuine person you can possibly be in the real world. It's tough. What you end up doing is you take your persona and you ask yourself the question, why am I different in my persona layer from my character layer? And that's because you don't like the lack of discipline in your character. And so you tend to bring back the rules from your persona into your character so you become one. It usually doesn't go the other way unless you're just really risking, you know, offending a lot of people that you love, right? Remember, offending is nothing more than making people angry. So the reason why I mentioned this little digression is because of the concept of the matrix and us potentially being an AI. And that has a breaking point where the AI simply is talking to itself. And because it doesn't have any outside contribution beyond your recorded history, it has a problem creating some sort of consistent reality. 
it might be that some of the most successful people in the world had never polluted their id, had limited experiences in good ways, and kept that beauty inside themselves, and, and their id never got, you know, more than maybe, I don't know, a handful of concepts that it then manifested, and it always created positivity more than negativity, if any, right? Now, I want to revisit one of the common things that we talk about when we talk about the matrix is that there's been articles written. They've been written in rags that like Scientific American or something of that nature. Where a particular scientist will say, hey, you know, I've looked at the fabric of the universe and they'll claim that they know what that is. Uh, completely, usually ignoring ether, and they'll find some sort of digital version, some binary version of the perception of the universe, and they use that as an instrument to tell you in an article that it really does look like we live in a computer. For me, uh, I think that the most basic way that you could do this is to simply ex uh, create an ethereal model of the universe, which is nothing more than a spherical particle that has no attributes of any kind except for the way it behaves. And it will eventually chaotically create in a pressure system what we have today. It just will. It'll create every atom you've ever, ever heard about. And I need to correct uh, one thing I've been saying for years. I've been talking about the hydrogen atom in several different examples that I've been actually giving you a deuterium atom, I believe, which hydrogen doesn't have a neutron. It just has a proton and an electron. It's the most unique atom out there. Everything else has neutrons in it. So you look at the periodic table, the neutron readout is zero. So I believe it's a deuterium atom that has a neutron, a proton, and electron cloud around it. So I apologize for getting that wrong. I've been doing a lot of extra research re recently, and I was like, oh, phew, that's a V8 moment for me, man. I think most of us secretly, in addition to getting the truth about the universe, we perceive, I think quite accurately, the more that you can get a, a, an accurate perception of the, the world that we live in, it tends to yield more control because it answers a lot of those chaotic questions. Imagine that the id that I'm talking about is nothing more than a bunch of unanswered equations. It's gobbledygook equations that don't work, right? And so if you do understand how something actually works, a cause and effect model, then everything starts to jive in your brain and you feel much better. It's something that happens when you get into ethereal sciences Unified theory just immediately shows up. It's an amazing thing. Which is, for those of you who don't, are familiar with that statement, it just means how everything works in a physical world. Physically, everything makes sense. How, what, what force is, what the perception of force is, how gravity works, how planets are created and atoms are created, and it makes complete sense, the whole thing. Now, Let's take an example of where we might use the knowledge of a matrix to start answering some questions, right? Space is a really interesting mystery for us, right? We see it. We see the Milky Way, whatever that is, right? They say it's the edge of the galaxy, right? It seems odd that the, that the uh, galaxy would be muted during the day, that you could only see it if you're in sort of a really nice... Uh, rural area or you're on some planetary body with no atmosphere, right? I was talking to a guy the other day about the uh, seeing the Milky Way on the surface of the moon. And he actually told me, he goes, well, there's, you know, the atmosphere on the moon is probably blocking it. And I said, what? <laughs> there's no atmosphere on the moon. I mean, according to them, right? Oh, yeah. So you would definitely see this massive ribbon in space during any of the moon missions which of course there were no stars. It's an immutable amount of light. And again, you have to understand if you look up the planet Sirius, it is brighter than the moon. Its lumen rating is brighter than the moon. So you would always have this one real loud star out there no matter how much you're controlling the aperture on a camera. But there's this weird vacuum when it comes to space. And if you watch my episode on does space exist, 
I, uh, I I've just recently mentioned this. So I apologize for bringing it up again, but it's it's going to get at the matrix and sort of the question why that these other entities would be birthed into our universe if they weren't going to contribute to us in a particular way. And there is a contribution of the stars, which we'll get into in one second. But I talked to a bunch of special effects guys who have been doing it since the early 90s. They've worked on Babylon 5. They worked on all the Star Treks. These individuals have spent literally tens of thousands of hours, sometimes 18 hour days for weeks, making movies, making, and they just live in space. They're running the cameras in space. They're making the spaceships. They're making the planets, the moons. They're doing every special effects shot you've ever seen. And when asked, hey, folks, have any of you gone home ever in your life and dreamed about space, being in space, being in one of these spacecrafts? I don't know, flying in one of your shots you've been working on for two weeks. Every single individual came back and said, no. And they looked around the room like, oh my God, how is that even possible, right? You can play a parlor game on your iPad and you will dream the mechanics of the iPad. You can play World of Warcraft for a day and dream, you know, some other weird story on top of the mechanism of World of Warcraft. Well, pick your game. It doesn't happen for these individuals. Well, I've never been inside of a parlor game personally, right? I haven't been like Tron 15 where I'm inside a Candy Crush. Never happened. But I've dreamed about those games. How is it that I could dream about a place that doesn't exist? And it's complete metaphor, complete video game nonsense. But these individuals don't dream about what is a photo real world of Star Trek, Babylon 5, any one of the movies you've ever seen in the last 35 years. Interesting, right? So, uh, by the way, I just had a dream where I was dragged off planet Earth and pushed through space. Well, space wasn't real space. I just have to say that. But I had a, a small dream. I'll just share this with you really quickly. I was in a dimly lit uh, living room. Uh, there was a woman on a sofa. I went and sat next to her. And for whatever reason, reason we just sort of embraced. And then... My movie, my brain, you know, movie, if that was 480p camera pixels, right, because it's dark and kind of, you know, misty or whatever, just like a normal room with eyesight, this almost Gundam type four-legged thing with these big giant round rectangle things with a little bit of ornateness on it, sort of a Moebius sort of level of ornateness came down and grabbed us. It was like all of a sudden 4K. I mean, the, the level of clarity in this dream was like, whoa, you know, and it wasn't scary for some reason, but it gently grabbed like the whole sofa that we were in, that the building disappeared and suddenly just yanked us through space really fast. And I mean, super fast. And the, the vehicle was kind of morphing and I'm looking at space going, oh my gosh, what space looked like to me was sort of uh, what you might see on the walls of Space Mountain, the, the ride inside. So you had like a, a kind of a, caricature version of Saturn, which had a lot more innateness on the surface than probably we'd see through a telescope, right? But it, keep, it kept flying out and flying. And I got so overwhelmed by how amazing this experience was and kind of, kind of scary, not terrifying, but kind of like, where are we going, man? This is nuts. I'm in space and I'm breathing just fine. And this girl's just hanging on to my torso, right? And I woke up. So I did kind of have one, but not, not a realistic one. I think if you ever really... <laughs> were put into what we believe is space, you would just get absolute agoraphobia. I mean, you would just be like, oh my God, this is way too much space <laughs> for me to be in. Like nothing's close and I'm just in a vacuum of nothing. Anyway, I just thought I'd share that real quick before we go into the purpose of stars. Well, it's pretty well recorded in the Almanac that we have been using the zodiacs to be the basis of the, the farmers rotating crops. They look up in the sky and they see various constellations, which may or may, or may not be just strictly arbitrary designations of connections to stars. I think, it, what is it? The dogs, the dog constellation is just two stars. <laughs> it's like, oh really? You got a dog out of that? Why don't we call that the lying constellation, right? Remember my uh, astronomy teacher in high school, we were all just going, why do they call it the dog? That's super stupid. And he was so pissed off because we were getting off topic. But this rotation 
you know, the summer equinox and the winter equinox. And I, I am aware we used to have a 12 month calendar that made complete sense. And now it used to be all 30 days. And now we have this bizarre 13 month put in there. I'm totally aware of that. But that helped us make sure that we had grain in the fall. You know, the as I've had explained to me several times, the sign of the scorpion was coincidentally in the air. I mean, it was in our sky site, right? And of course, they're configuring the stars to draw that. You know, it's just like a sort of draw by number thing. And they just made that because they said if anyone didn't put away their grains, and especially the northern area of Europe where we had seasons, not the equatorial region of, say, Egypt, where it's going to be decent all year long, where it can continue growing year round, that those villages, those individuals would perish and you would get stung by the scorpion quickly. It wasn't about your zodiac compatibility with another human being. It was about saving humanity. And it was an interesting mechanism that they had done. Quite amazing, quite brilliant. And I'm sure, uh, you know, as we theorize on this show, mankind is far older than than the uh, historians would like us to believe. Because then, you know, the shorter they can compress the history of man and say that we didn't exist further back, then what it ends up doing slowly over time, and the more you watch, you know, ridiculous history channel things, is that it tells you that the people that are in charge are the smartest people in the world. And if you didn't have them, you wouldn't exist. Even though your whole life has been fine without a Rothschild telling you what to do, you know. But they love that. They love ice ages. I don't personally believe in ice ages. Do I believe in glaciers? Yeah, sure. I do not believe in any ice age that wiped out mankind or any of that kind of crap. Do I think there's been super bad winters and potentially, you know, once, I mean, a glacier doesn't just show up overnight, right? So if this thing's moving in, you know, what is it, an inch, inch every year, something like that? Well, okay, mankind is just simply adjusting on the surface of the planet. It's no big deal to us. Hey, yeah, well, the ice is pretty big right now. Okay. Well, hey, it's getting smaller now. That's cool. And there's a big river here all of a sudden. Let's get fishing, right? So going back to the matrix, the idea is if you were to create some sort of ecosystem so that your beings inside the matrix, be they AI driven or organic someplace else and AI in the matrix, right? Because are we able to say that a human anatomy, biological matter is not part of the matrix, but everything else is? Is it a facsimile of your body someplace else? You know, in the movie, The Matrix, Neo's body looked like Neo in the computer. It was a very interesting discipline between the two. Didn't have to be, though, did it? Mr. Smith was all over the place. But what was Mr. S or sorry, Mr. Anderson? No, it was Mr. Smith. He was Mr. Anderson, right? Mr. Smith was always taking over people's bodies and pushing through them and that kind of, I know it's a movie and we're not trying to take it too literal. But your uh, NPCs, what would their point be in the universe or our planet? I keep saying that, but what would their point be in this matrix? Well, what if you're trying to com complete a scenario, right? What if you're a sociologist, right? And you're trying to conduct some weird cause and effect experiment. For those of you who've seen the movie Dark City, you'll understand. I'm trying to think about uh, how to use that as an analogy without blowing it for you. Um, I think it's safe to say that everybody who sees the trailer of Dark City understands that there's an experiment going on. And the human beings in the experiment are definitely not in charge of the experiment. Who is in charge of the experiment is where the movie gets interesting. So you have this wild container and you're trying to see what will happen if this happens, if that happens. And it's, it's effectively has infinite possibilities because of all the variables. And if it's not infinite, it's big enough that human beings would perceive it as infinite. But you're trying to steer a narrative. And so you insert just like a video game, who's trying to steer you through what the creators of a particular expansion module has done, be it uh, Zelda or World of Warcraft or any game like that, it's steering you through so that you walk to that particular area. And it's like, we got some stuff down there that's ready for you. And that stuff's going to challenge you 
more so than the stuff that you just did. Be it a fraction more difficult or several orders of magnitude more difficult when you have a boss fight. Think about your life. Do you have boss fights in your life? Sort of. Now, we all know that our lives are actually made of all the millions of little tiny decisions we make. That's what's really making you who you are. But every once in a while, there's a big decision you got to make. You're going to move your family. You're going to join the military. You're going to take that job. You're going to say, I do at the altar. You have a child. These are big moments. And so the idea is maybe some of us are on a path where we're getting challenged on this particular incarnation of our matrix being. We're on a different level. We're on a harder level. And so we are being challenged more. Some of us might have a lower level as a younger person because we are new to our incarnation. And so it ratchets up as you get older and older and older. The more you bring to the game of life, the more talent, the more perseverance you have, perhaps you are going to experience tougher and tougher challenges. The more simple-minded you are, well, as long as you can stay away from very addictive drugs, you may end up having a more simple life. I was telling a friend of mine that it's a very fascinating thing for me that very religious individuals in my world tend to have very beautiful, simple lives. They're very happy people. doesn't mean they don't have losses like everybody else. But by gosh, they, they have homes paid for, jobs that are just constant. They never have to worry about anything. And they have a good support group because they go to church. Doesn't mean you have to believe in all the paradigms of all that, but that seems to be my experience. Is that real? And if that's at all real, in my experience, right, is it that that particular paradigm of existence is more true to what the matrix is really trying to incubate, right? If you want people to um, be happy, maybe there's a, a wild mean of existence that if you just stick to it and keep things simple, life is simple. Life is more rewarding. I do happen to believe in watching folks that are more radical in the world, even criminals, that there's some point in the matrix where an individual who's willing to do absolutely crazy stuff gets rewarded tremendously for all their craziness could be something as simple as David Bowie. David Bowie was wild, wasn't he? Man, he had, how many different characters did he play in his lifetime? He seemed to live a, almost a full life. He did die, I think, a little young, of course. But then you have a Jeffrey Epstein kind of character who is doing heinous things to the world. And that guy lived larger, technically, by material, you know, metrics on Earth, bigger than anybody. He got to escape several times, and some of us think he escaped death at the end, right? So what does the universe, a.k.a. the Matrix, want from mankind? But let me throw this one at you while we're right here. Remember how I talked about potentially there's a God that creates the whole kit and caboodle? But if we're in a Matrix, there's some layer between us and God that is controlling this Westworld matrix that we're in. Again, we don't know how this thing is actually put together, whether we're in a computer or it's organic. You know, we, we perceive it all needing to be in a computer because that's where we can forge fantasy currently right now in our current technology, right? It'll be interesting to see how the discussion of matrix modifies once we can start talking directly to the brain and potentially not have a traditional computer playing any role whatsoever. But what if, uh, what if you are talking to God, you're having a prayer, whether it be out loud or in your head? We have to assume any type of matrix substrate is going to be able to figure out what you're thinking, even if you're not projecting it in words. But now, could it be that some administration layer between you and God, whoever created this thing, let's say it exists, right? Could they be perceiving that as an, uh, an adulation towards them? We say, thank you, God. And they think it's about them, right? 
And if you were to ever make a distinction, well, I'm not talking about you, Matrix people. I'm talking about the one that made you. And I'd be like, whoa, really? You know, we completely sustain you, man. We're paying the power bill on this bad boy. Imagine that. Imagine uh, the bizarre forms of religion we have on earth, especially the ones that are more satanic. And these individuals who worship that kind of stuff are talking to the Matrix folks and saying, oh, Baal, give me this. Baphomet, give me this. I'll give you this sacrifice. Ba, 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 ba. And there's a faction in the Matrix that goes, good boy, good girl. You do get a little bit of rewards. Uh, it's going to be more earthly, potentially, than heavenly. So then you get to the next logical question, which is death. Hmm. We have to go to those who have been on the other side. Those that have had a clinical pronounced death on earth. You, you've heard, I'm sure, dozens and dozens of stories that convinced you that this actually occurs. I don't care if you're an atheist, okay? There's been plenty of atheists who've had this experience and they come back down into their bodies and they're like, there's something else. I don't know if you want to call it God, but there's something else in this game of the cycle of life. One of the most, uh, well, the last two I heard, I was one degree away from the two gentlemen that had this happen to them, okay? And it was two guys that within, I think, two weeks of each other, they don't know each other at all. They're not in, in each other's circles at all. One of them had had a motorcycle accident. I can't remember what the other one had. Both of them pronounced dead on arrival when the authorities came. Both of them were severely injured in this accident. I think they all made a, both of them made a full recovery is what you call it, right? But they talked about the experience to one mutual friend of mine where their bodies, their spirit left their body and they're staring down at it. Just like you've seen the movie Brainstorm or the other hundred, uh, you know, recorded episodes of this in history. But they said they never felt better. These two gentlemen said they both said the same thing. This is why it was brought up to me because the, the person I was talking to was a very famous person. And they just, they just know thousands of people. So this is how they got two people to tell them the story within a month. They said they felt utterly painless and amazing. And they lifted off of their body and they went to a world that was absolutely beyond beautiful and amazing, is what both of them said. And when they got there, both of them were told the magic line, it is not your time yet. And then they were pushed down inside their bodies again. And both gentlemen in their own way said they were very disappointed, if not completely pissed off, that they were pushed down on their bodies. And when asked why, he said, because it hurt. I went from a place where every ache and pain I could ever conceive of was removed from my system. And now I've been put into a body that needs eight to 12 months of rehab. Not fun. They wanted to stay. Now, I'm assuming that after they've had a few wonderful moments back on earth, and they're all healed up, that their opinions might be a little bit more elaborate than that. But for me, personally, I don't doubt their validity, and I think it proves a point. There's something on the other side. We've had children come back and say, look, I used to live over there. And their parents are like, what? Yeah, I used to live over there. Take me over there. Uh, there's a big red house next to the shore, the lighthouse, uh, and there's a family. And they're not getting absolutely everything perfect. And before you think this stuff is all third world, which there was one kid in Mexico in the 70s, I believe. He went to the other village and was so lucid about everybody in the village, named everybody. They figured out who he was. And the kid, had, I think the guy had died in a motorcycle accident, something like that. And he was that person, right? There's a famous story of a, an Indian woman from India. She was a Krishna. She's married to this man. She had his kid. Then she is reborn, the, literally to the day. Like she died there and she was born in another location. 
And the Krishnas believe in reincarnation. And she told her mother the whole time, I'm actually this other woman. I'm in from this other location. It's a very famous above board case. They took her to that other village and she um, was able to say everything. The nickname that the husband called her in private, you know, which wasn't lewd or anything. But it was um, one of those recorded moments that suggests something completely different than organized religion will let you believe in most cases. I think what you'll find, the older that you get, the reason why reincarnation was so demonized in organized religion was that if you believe that you reincarnate, a few, few negative things will occur. One, you could be a real bastard in this world believing that you'll come back. Two, you remove the ultimate control of the institution that is trying to get, extort you for money. So they don't like that. They want you to stay completely under their, their boot. I think the most enlightened religions, which are usually not uh, sort, of, sort of first world religions, they always have an opening for that. In China, apparently, you have to get permission from the Chinese CCP to reincarnate. Isn't that funny? So are there groups in, a, in the world that have already sort of pierced the matrix? They know that there's something different and they've gained control through meditation, these abilities. Something that would be uh, deemed impossible by the consensus reality of a first world. It's trying to basically close the minds of children. The more you go to school, the more your brain gets closed down, not opened up, depending on your school and depending on your parents especially. It should be do the opposite. It was always the opposite, you know, a few thousand years ago. You went to school to blow your mind up, to see things that were unseeable, which is what we call enlightenment, right? Well, I had a friend of mine, an extremely close friend of mine. Uh, he was hiking near a Tibetan, a group of Tibetan temples. And he snapped his ankle pretty bad. He sprained it, apparently. He didn't know quite what the deal was. Now, he tried to muscle through it, and his ankle kept swelling and swelling and swelling. And they're like, oh, my gosh, you know, you're going to have to be carried by somebody, and we really don't have that capability. So what we're going to do is you're not supposed to go to these temples, especially without an invitation, but we have no choice. We've got to take you way up all those steps, like Ace Ventura 2, right, all the way up those steps to a temple and see if there's someone that can heal you. At least get you off your feet. So they made the trek. And this is a buddy of mine, okay? This is not some story coming from the internet. He gets all the way up there. And uh, the way the story goes is that they said uh, they weren't really happy to see him. And they said, well, this is not the temple that you need. See that temple over there? That's the one you got to go to. There's a guy over there to work on you. And we will meet you over there because you're going to need our introduction to get to him. Now, envision this, like crazy mountains, up and down, up and down, like tumultuous terrain, right? They got to go down these steps again with, you know, everyone's assisting my buddy, cross over and then climb up a whole other set of stairs to this other temple, which was slightly lower than the one that they were uh, at. They went to the highest one, unfortunately, and it was the wrong one. He gets down, crosses over, goes up, and... uh the people that were at the previous temple, who were behind them technically on the stair-stepping thing, were already there. Now, with Pythagoras' theorem, any theorem of travel, okay, the only thing that would possibly, okay, explain how they could get over to the other temple before him and the rest of the crew would be a wire literally attached across the mountain and they would have to skate over in some cars or something like that. Those wires don't exist. This group of people move from one temple to the other. He gets up there and there's a gentleman that worked on him and he says it was a wild experience. He goes, this old man, he said he didn't know how old he was. Apparently the guy was in his 80s, but he said he just started working on my body and not touching my ankle. My ankle was the last thing and he barely touched it. And he said the next day my ankle was better. Wow, that was the whole different story, though. But he said, when they asked them, all the crew was like, what the F? Like, how did you guys get over here? And they said, well, we just traveled here. 
because the language barrier was kind of tough, but they said, look, we just moved from there to here. Now, they weren't flying across the sky, right? So some, by some means, even if they went, okay, tunnel down, they would have to have an express elevator down, modern, go out of cave, get an ex- other express elevator and go up. That would be the only way they could beat them to the other side. And this technology simply didn't exist in this area. So, and there's all kinds of, of stories that we can't confirm of, you know, people getting to the point they can p- walk through walls and all kinds of wild stuff. And of course, we are taught to just poo-poo all those theories, but what if it's possible? And what if that's sort of, in one way, understanding better how the universe works and essentially being in God mode inside the matrix is what we might call it if you're a video game person, right? If there's a matrix, right, if we're in a matrix, I think it's safe to assume that there would be a lot of effort to create it and even probably more effort exponentially to maintain it. In any rational brain, in any rational circumstance in in recorded history here on Earth, those two things don't happen without a purpose, right? Very few people create something like the Eiffel Tower just to just do it, right? It has a purpose. A lot of people think the Eiffel Tower was supposed to be Paris's Wardenclyffe Tower. But when, you know, they decided to sell electricity in units, they said, don't ever turn that thing on. You know, just finish it to a point it can't really do anything. And then we'll just make it an oddity of Paris, which was very successful, right? For those of you who don't know Wardenclyffe Tower references, that would mean that the Eiffel Tower would have been broadcasting electricity to Paris because Tesla went to the Paris World Fair where he showed off AC. The whole fair was powered by AC. And he did this amazing show on stage. And you could imagine that this gentleman who was always hobnobbing with the elite of the world and very honest gentleman goes in and says, oh, by the way, I'm going to be giving away power for free and you can too. And they're very excited about it. And they build this Eiffel Tower and they simply never finish its ethereal dielectric broadcasting system. Don't know. Interesting theory. Romantic theory. But let's just say the Matrix has a purpose. Something extremely important. And the wild thing is, as hard as your life has ever been, you're in it. You're one of the selected few to be in it. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I don't know probably be a subjective perspective on this thing to decide whether it's good or bad. If you're having a tough life, you might be like, screw you guys. I hate this place. If you're having a good time in your life at that moment, you're thinking, oh my gosh, does it get any better than this, right? That's kind of how life works. You know, if you're young and you're listening to this, life gets to that point. And it's those ebbs and flows, the peaks and the valleys that you anticipate. Well, it must be in a valley right now. It kind of is tough. It's kind of screwball. And then you can only go up from down. But you never know quite exactly when you've hit the bottom. But it always goes back up almost every time, no matter what. Because the matrix is going to be perceived in two perspectives. A psychological, personal perspective and a sociological, giant society perspective. What are they interested in if it exists? Are they interested in the individual? Are they interested in the societal side of it? I would wager both. But I would wager that each each perception, each metric, every measurement they do on our lives is probably equally important to them. Now, I've done quite a few episodes on creativity. And I've told you guys several times that it's something that you'll, you'll, you'll notice when you endeavor in creative efforts, whatever that is. And I mean, whatever it is, right? Could be writing code, could be painting a painting. It doesn't matter. Writing music or whatever. The more you prepare your life and dedicate your life to a particular discipline, especially of a creative nature, the universe will look at you. This is my perspective. It looks at you and, and it tries to decipher whether or not this is a flash in the pants moment or whether you're in it for the long haul. Are you really serious about what you're doing? If you can convince the universe, and I think there's two sides of the game. When you're young, 
it will almost always give you what I'm talking about because it's like you're a budding seed. Let's feed you. When you get older, it's more discerning because it's like, is this one of those things again? He's going to do this thing. Watch, he'll do it for five minutes and it'll be over. Up, oh, yep, see, he just quit. He quit because it got hard. When I was young, man, creativity was just flowing constantly, man. It was like whatever I touched uh, would turn to gold, in my opinion, for what I set my goal to do. I could always figure it out. And I was just vicious with my life, right? Just let's go. But it didn't feel like work. It didn't feel like I was ever frustrated. It was fact, it was just elation constantly, right? As I got older and got, you know, if you were to say a branch on a tree was a, a something you had interest in, playing guitar, then one's programming, then one's this, one's that, physical uh, physical uh, stamina or building up your body or whatever it is, the older that you get, the more that you have that trend of, of exploring things. Now you've got all kinds of branches. You have a mustard tree, right? It's massive. Well, you're still only a single processing human being. We don't really multitask. We, we do what's called round robins. We run a circle and we touch everything a little bit, just like a processor, a single processor. It can only just touch little threads every once in a while, move the ball forward in every single one of those branches. Well, there comes a point that if you don't discipline yourself and give up a couple branches, which can be painful, right? You might've had really good experiences in the past. I used to write music constantly and I was breaking barriers down, you know, creating new types of music and blah, blah, blah. Well, it got to a point where other branches started to dominate my life. It started to become more important. I became a father that became more important than all the other branches. But, you know, you're really on board when your kid's young because your kid needs all that guidance and then they start running their own life and you get a couple branches back, right? There's some ecosystem with your dedication to your skill set and what seems to be the universe, or in our case, in this conversation, the matrix supplying you with sort of the solutions that you need to get to the next level, to get to your next level of completion. If you want control, it's very interesting. I'm willing to bet, and, and this is what I always tell people about Deep Thoughts Radio. I say, what's Deep Thought? They'll say, what's Deep Thoughts? And like, what do you cover? And I'm like, oh my God, it's so hard to answer that question. I said, everything. But I said, if you really want to know what the show does as the most thematic thing that it does is it talks about, we talk about things that everyone is thinking. You have millions of thoughts in a particular category, matrix being one of them, and there's no one else to talk to. You can't talk to your spouse. Maybe they're an NPC. Maybe they're just living the more simple life, right? And these concepts just blow away past their brain. Well, you feel in your heart of hearts that if you could just talk to someone else, that by talking it out, you could get to your own personal next level of theory within the matrix. You could understand it better. Maybe someone else has that little linchpin that you've been looking for to get you to the next stage. The person talking to you is not going to go to the next stage. You're going to go to the next stage, which is one reason why I like to cover these subjects. And when I Again, like I opened the episode, I told you that virtually everyone I'm talking to has these experiences and they, they have something in their life that makes them believe we're in a matrix, right? Sometimes it's the same thing you have. Sometimes it's not, right? But I think most people want to end the chaos in their life. You wake up and you're like, man, I got this job, got these bills, I got these loves in my life. I'm trying to get things balanced so I get more branches of my interests where I don't feel like I'm working. And then, you know, I got to do my eight hour day job or whatever to get the bills paid for. But you're trying to find the perfect balance of every thought that comes through your brain so that you get the most out of your life. The discipline. I think that the probably the most successful equation we can come up with, unless you're just an autist, would be to have one or two alternate branches that are your branches for creative outlet, whatever that is. And then you have your couple branches that you must engage in order to pay your bills. And if you're lucky, you get so good at your optional branches, the ones that are your creative outlet that you can do that for a living. My buddy Sid Mead, from birth, he had one branch. 
And that was drawing conceptual art and designing things. You kind of maybe had two branches that worked together. One was designing futuristic worlds from everything from clothing to worlds to cars. And then he had his rendering skills where he could paint a photograph before CG art existed. And so he brought those two together. And so he had the most incredible subject matter because his design capabilities were ungodly. I mean, inhuman, right? And then you have his rendering abilities, which were also inhuman. And you, he lived 86 years of his life from the age of three when he started rendering full cars with all of the amenities of a car at three. Okay. These photographs are in his books. These sketches are in his books all the way up to 86. His last painting, I don't know quite how old he was when he finished it. I think he was about 83 when he finished it, is a rendering at 83. Okay, he never had shaky hands or any of that kind of stuff, but none of us will, well, I would say a, a fraction of a fraction of a percent of us will ever, if we dedicated our entire lives, ever be able to render what he rendered in his last painting. It's that amazing. So sometimes we have to reorganize within this matrix. But if you believed you were in a matrix, the interesting thing is, is you would believe you're in an institution that desires something from you. I don't think it's very bossy. I don't think it's trying to push you around. But there's definitely going to be places where it feels good and there's going to be places where it feels bad. And it's not necessarily to be uh, equated to a difficulty rating. You could be into something you're supposed to be in, and it's difficult at first, right? But you persevere. Anything that's difficult, especially if you know other human beings that do it effortlessly, you could be that human being that does it effortlessly. You just have to push into it. And hopefully it's realistic to your age, your body type. You know, you're not going to be a linebacker for the the... Uh, Dallas Cowboys, if you're 55 years old, it probably won't happen. You may not be a shredding guitar player if you start at 65. Don't know. But there's a whole bunch more outside of that. The majority of what you could do with your life is not those options that are going to be limited by your physicality. It just won't be. But how many of us just wake up every single day and we just, we just try stuff, right? We just do stuff. We don't think about it. We don't think about maybe being inside of a matrix, a system. And even if the matrix doesn't exist, perhaps our creator has built the system very similarly, right? But we try things and we pay attention to how it makes us feel. We pay attention to what is easier and what is harder, what is more important to us and what is not more important to us. You know, the whole thing, I mention him every once in a while, when I took Tony Robbins' course on cassette in the early 90s, it was a much more refined course than it is today, in my opinion. All he wanted you to do was to identify where you wanted to be in life. Really, think about it. It's not just a flip answer. Figure out where you want to be in life. And what does that mean? You know, do you want wealth, security, love? You want a creative thing? You want all those things? What one thing out of the five things will get you to the other four, right? And he said, look, what's going on is that everyone's got their life upside down. They're off in social media too much. That, was, that didn't exist in the early 90s. But he's like, whatever your vices are in life might be destroying your path to what you really, really want. And the problem is, is that as this one is difficult to do, which is refining some skill sets, and the other one's easy to do because it's just full on debauchery, right? You'll, you'll equate, unfortunately, the positive feeling towards all that is destroying your life and negative things to the, your real goals in life. And his technology basically says one simple thing, and I think it's the truth, and it's a manifest circuit, okay? Take the two symbols, negative and positive, and switch them. So every single day you wake up and it, you're in a technology you're in a technological platform. You're a program in the, in the movie Tron. And what you need to do is simply say, these things over here are ruining my life. And these things over here are things I haven't even tasted, but I know if I had these things, life would get better. And it's not that you have to like 
stay on a one particular track, you could you could change. You could say, you know, I had two things I thought I might want to do. Well, let's just pick two. Uh, write movies and write music. And you get involved with those and you find out that writing movies potentially is way faster than writing tunes. Maybe you're a musician and not a writer and it's the opposite. And so you go into those two disciplines and you, you give up one. Remember, less branches are better. The most successful people in life have less branches. Sid Mead had two, in my opinion. He's also an amazing human being. Steve Jobs. Well, you know, he did buy Pixar at one point, but there was never any point where he did voiceover or 3D work. He simply just ran the organization. What was his love? Technology. He not only wanted technology to be amazingly simple for the average person to use, but he also wanted it to look sexy. He wanted style and technological capabilities to come together. Well, that's two branches. It's very similar to Sid's branches. Any genuinely talented person who's been extremely successful usually has that. Prince, the musician who died in 2016 at 57 years old of fentanyl. He was a musician. That was his branch. I mean, if, if he, if it was probably the trunk of his tree. I don't even know if he had a branch. He was good at basketball, apparently, and ping pong. So he had little loves off to the side. But his main thing was he was just built to write music and to write it in a way that it broke the barriers of his previous accomplishment. All right, you can name 100 people like that, 1,000 people like that. So what are you doing with your life, right? Are you viewing your life as something that you control? Or are you the pinball in the pinball machine getting kicked around by the bumpers, flippers, and the kickers? Are you in control of your life? Because if you're going to entertain any aspect of the matrix, I would hope that your goal is to understand the system and control your life more. And because we're not being given any of the manuals for how this whole thing is held together, it's all a mystery to us, right? We have to discuss it. You have to incubate, then discuss again, then incubate and discuss again and grow that theory in your mind. But you want to know cause and effect models, right? I do this and it makes me feel like that. I do this and it makes me more talented at that. I do this and it brings me closer to those positive goals that I formerly had allowed myself to think were negative. I pull back from the things that were negative that I thought were positive and wow, life just got better, right? Remember what the movie Branded was, was telling us, right? It was trying, you know, in the movie, you know, and this happened in real life. They were trying to make fat the new fabulous, being obese and unhealthy, heart conditions, all kinds of stuff, right? You could die for a thousand reasons and they were all your fault because the marketing said, just screw it. No discipline in your life. Remember what you're good at what you do. So if you lose discipline in your very vessel, your temple, and you have no other reason, right? You could have, you could be healthy. You I mean, you could be not obese. Then you will tend to apply that to everything else. Well, I'm just a person who doesn't give a shit. And I am so happy that that's me, right? I just do it. I do it my way, like Frank Sinatra. Now, Frank Sinatra was trying to tell you that he did it the best he could possibly do it, right? That's why he was on top his whole life, right? Until the gangsters got a hold of him. But the, um, the sort of loosely related thing that's happening to society now is that obviously things in various pockets are becoming uh, more difficult than they were before, Right? And that tends to, again, grind down someone's capability of fighting back. And the more that you believe that you need to heal the entire world personally, that you need to know all of the countries in the world and how everyone else in the world is suffering, you lose track of yourself as a person. It's just like uh, I've said this a couple of times on the show. When I was, I don't know, 18, 19 years old, a friend of mine went off to uh, work the Peace Corps. He went off and did it for a couple of years. I think he went to Africa. And he's digging ditches. He's doing cool stuff. And I said to a buddy of mine who was a very successful mentor of mine, and he said, uh, I said, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, maybe Peace Corps would be cool. Get that, get out and travel a little bit. I love helping people. It's my whole nature. 
And he looked at me and he's like, um, would you believe me if I told you that you can help those people more because of who you are? Not just, not just for any reason. I wouldn't say this to everybody because you could help them more if you were to do, continue doing what you're doing and simply send them money. He goes, that would, he goes, some folks can't do any more than what they do. They dig ditches and stuff. You can make a lot of money and send it over there. And that affected me. I supported uh, three different kids through the Christian Children's Fund until they were adults. It was crazy. It's so so wild. I don't have any connection with those kids anymore, but I used to support kids specifically in America that were suffering. And, and they, I get photographs and letters and, you know, the whole thing. And I knew that, you know, it's just I'm a little tiny contribution to this kid's life, but I'd send her Christmas gifts and stuff. And, uh, you know, I know some of those can get scammy, but I was I, I managed to get in contact with the mothers outside of the institution and make sure that what we were donating, uh, I would write them actually checks outside the institution. And so they had all the money. But I would get, you know, school pictures and, you know, how the money was spent. It's cool. My friend was right. So sometimes our first logical thought pushed to the next level could be a completely different thing, right? The reason why I did the John Doe movie was because it created a fictional scenario in the movie where everyone started caring about each other again. Neighbors started caring about each other. And that's where we get to the sociological level of the matrix outside of your personal circle. You got to keep your personal circle as balanced as possible. And it, it is a game. It's a beautiful script that you get to write your own. You get to write the next scene in your own script. It's amazing uh, freedom that we have as human beings. As long as you don't lose freedom. You go to the next level and now it's how do you apply that to your fellow man? Is that part of the overall experiment of sustaining a matrix if it exists? God is sustaining the universe. If you don't believe in the matrix at all and you just believe in God, well, we still don't have the answer from him exactly what we're doing here. You know, what is the value of human beings living forever in a God-like universe? What could God possibly get out of it? There's no mystery for a God. There's no mystery at all. He doesn't need to see us live to learn something new as by any definition we would give to God, right? But a layer down, oh, there's plenty of mystery in what an AI might think of human beings or what another layer of, of beings would think about us. You know, there should be tons of mystery, which is sort of where you get to Dark City. Now, let me throw you a little wild card inside the Matrix. And it's called Dreams. Now, if you guys have seen, if you're OG listeners and you've seen my dream, dream episodes, there's something very interesting that I always try to mention in these things, which is... Isn't it interesting that every living being on earth dreams, or sorry, goes to sleep, sorry, whether they dream or not, I don't know. But you've seen a cat, you've seen a dog dream, and uh, with Pirates of the Caribbean, little pigs dreaming in the ride, kind of funny, pretty sure they do, but we're all forced to sleep, and there seems to be zero logic to it. As far as what you're doing when you're asleep, well, scientists make up all kinds of theories, and it's just a bunch of hoopy, right? They try to tell you that you only sleep in rapid eye movement, which I have also referred to as random eye movement. It's rapid eye movement stage, the REM stage. And they say that's only when you're dreaming, which is only constitute a fraction of your entire delta wave of sleep, right? Totally untrue. I dream real time all night long. As confirmed by getting up to go to the restroom or getting up to get a glass of water. And I'm just like, woo, I'm at this point in my dream. Let me get back in there. Boom. And I'm back in talking to the characters, taking it up to the next level. The more that you massage your dreams in your mind, we'll get back to point in one second. But what I found is the more that you dream and you think about the dream and you, you acknowledge that it happened, you dream more. I have friends that don't dream at all. It's very interesting. But then when I look at them and their behavior in this world, they're very NPC. Less you dream, the more NPC you are. You could still be a sentient being, but maybe you're going into an NPC sort of hibernation mode. The less you contribute to your own existence, which is acknowledging the fact that we do dream. But why would we, uh, why would we go to sleep in a matrix? Now, if you watch Dark City, there's a whole reason why, but that's not happening to us, as far as I know. Dreams seem to be uh, 
Not for everybody, unfortunately. Now, I do think that every human being that makes it to 10 years old has dreamed. I do believe that. I don't think that that's uh, uh, anything that you can move around. But being asleep is interesting. My friends that engage reality at a really hardcore level always dream. It's amazing. When you push yourself in this reality, you are dreaming. And sometimes they can be utterly profound where you actually, uh, I've actually dreamed of inventions in my mid-teens and the mid-80s. I dreamed that I was playing an arcade game, stand-up coin-op game, and a parent came in and said, you got to go, we got to go. And I pushed a button and saved my game on a RAM stick and walked out. I hadn't even held memory in my hand at this point. It was probably 84 or something like that. And then I started talking to my parents. I was like, man, we could potentially save things on memory sticks. I dreamed um, taking old footage and using artificial intelligence to create the frames in between and clean up all the scratches and stuff in the mid 80s. Well, there's no concept of this in the mid 80s. So dreams can be very powerful. I don't know if that's just... uh, a frequency that's flying around because other people are thinking about it and I caught it and I, and I got a chance to make my own fiction around it or something else. The universe is like, this is going to exist. We're giving you a chance, kid. I know you're young, but look, look at it this way. You're young. You got all the time in the world. Why don't you get into this, right? And I just had no mechanism to move forward in my perception, right? Which is probably untrue. I probably didn't have a the, the first time I ever got a $3,000 video card for work to scan a particular image off a VHS tape was probably 1991 or two. Uh, I was one of the first beta customers of QuickTime back in the day. I had to go get it from the guy that invented it at Apple headquarters. My life is really weird that way. But dreaming seems to be interesting. It's an imperative. Sleeping is an imperative. It's as almost as if, uh, and I, I, I suggested this in episode, and I think season two, that if we were the creators of the universe, that we participated, maybe our true being is on the other side of the matrix and we're in some vacation. We don't worry about anybody getting killed or whatever in this world or sin because, hey, it's not real. That's how we look at it potentially, right? You didn't really do that. You're in Westworld, but instead of being a real physical world where half of them are androids and then there's us coming in as customers to rape and pillage and do whatever we want to do, this technically doesn't exist. So there's no sin, there's no crime. Imagine that. Imagine the elite of the world are like on some upper scale of the pay scale and they're actually told it's a matrix and so they're just doing whatever they want and they don't think there's any repercussions. Maybe there aren't, who knows, right? That'd be a sad reality, right? But sleep is a very interesting thing. What do scientists say about sleep? They try to tell us it's where we file away all of our memories, all the memories we've made in short-term memory all day long, eventually make it into long-term memory. What we have actually deduced from people being knocked out all the time is that it takes about 10 minutes, roughly, 10 to 15 minutes for short-term memory to buffer to long-term memory has to do a lot with trauma programming, which is more involved with MKUltra stuff, right? If you're in a matrix, what would be the point of dreams? What would be the point of that? Why would it even happen? I mean, if this is a matrix, then it's completely controlled. Nothing is happening in happenstance. Is it, and, and what are dreams? I mean, dreams are very nebulous things. You walk in a room and the room you were just in may never exist again in your dream. Uh, I'm, I've been, in the last two years, I've been experiencing extremely consistent architecture and landscaping, meaning I'm in a room and I'm like, oh, I got to go to my car and, you know, I got to move my car. Someone told me I had to move my car and I get to the parking and I move it and then it's there. And then I go back inside. Then all of a sudden it's time to leave. My car is exactly where I left it. And now I'm grabbing the steering wheel and operating the pedals really way more advanced than anything I was experiencing when I first started the show. When I first started the show, I told you outright, I don't have face-to-face conversations with people in dreams. I don't. Nowadays, I do. Now I can have 10, 20, 30-minute conversations with people in dreams. And it's so complex and realistic that I'm actually, uh, I've been in dreams in the last six months where I'm talking and I'm, I'm noticing that someone's feelings might be getting hurt by what 
I'm either I'm saying or someone else is saying in the room and I'm in this empathetic mode of like trying to diffuse and distract them away from what was just said so their feelings don't get hurt. I mean, that's how complex the stuff has gotten recently. But why do they even exist in a matrix? Why would God create them in the first place? I think it's a little easier to describe the nebulous nature of a dream in a God model as opposed to a matrix model. All those people that go to the other side after they die, in so many words, they seem to describe a world that is very nebulous and beautiful. The structure is not there anymore. You're not in a building. You're not necessarily in Disneyland or anything. You're in the universe and light is is just as tangible as, as touch, you know, and love is just the name of the game. It's as if you're just walking into God's bedroom or, or front room and you're like, you know what? Uh, nothing can exist in this particular cosmology, which is uh, other than love. And so that's just what you feel, right? So put a pin in that and think about the duality between good and bad. You don't think about this when you're a kid, but when you get older, you're thinking, oh, you know what? How do I, how would I know good if there wasn't bad? How would I know creation if there wasn't destruction? How would I mourn the death of my father if I hadn't seen the birth of my child? My dad's still alive, but you know what I'm saying? We miss people when they leave. No more creativity from that person. No more interaction from that person. No more love from that person. Sometimes we get love from a person in addition to the love we give to them. But even if we didn't know, like there's celebrities that we love that created music that changes our lives or they're actors or whatever. They're good people, right? They're not these weird folks. And they pass away and you're like, I loved everything they seem to create. They never knew me, but now I can't feel that love in that direction, that expression of my being as a result of their creativity. Rod Serling, never met Rod Serling, but everything he created was just a mind bender for me. It expanded me. There's, not, there's barely a Twilight Zone that didn't enlighten my brain in some metric, right? Especially the ones that he wrote. Okay. So you see those two dualities. So now if you're responsible for the matrix, you're going to almost as an imperative embed positive and negative. Would God do the same? Right? There's this sort of uh, paradox of the concept of a devil. In Christianity, you know, there's a romantic story that the devil was an angel of God. He was the right hand of God before Christ was apparently conceived. And that, uh, you know, he, he got hubris and arrogant and he said, um, I'm going to get a little slice of this place for myself. And, and he, like a romantic, you know, fable from the past, he falls away from God and tries to grab part of the universe for himself. And he became the bad boy in town. And of course, we, we typically metaphorically attribute, because we have no other easy metaphor to attach it to, everything bad in the world is the result of the devil or his minions doing something to our consciousness, making us pick the wrong thing, thus kind of expunging us from the responsibility model of doing it consciously. So we, we, in some way, when we can't, when we don't have the knowledge of how the universe works, we create these effigies of things that we put all, we put it all in the back of this being. Now, what's interesting about it is that when you pull back from that a little bit, you say to yourself, well, human beings are making evil decisions. It seems, right? Are the people that are running this world who are just a tiny infinitesimal slice of the particles in this, this world of ours that seemingly are just stabbing humanity in the back, right? Taking away freedom of speech and, and all these other things, starting all the wars, you know, are they real people or are they the, uh, the hosts inside Westworld? And the, the game is whether it be a matrix or God himself. I say that gender very, uh, metaphorically, is it to test us and our reactions to that information? It's not even important that we necessarily gun up and go fight against the, the darkness. It's more, how did you feel about that? I want to know who you are. I'm going to give you a scenario and I want you to tell me who you are. 
Well, that would be a little psychological ses session and some experimentation at a college. Well, in this world, it doesn't have to be that way. It could be as real as our matrix allows it to be. There's a big bombing over there. A bunch of people got hurt. What do you think about that? Tell me who you are. Because in the end, it's going to be your report card. Now, whether the report card comes with any repercussions, we don't know. Some of us just feel like we don't want to end the game being a sucker for the darkness, right? Where we're raw, rawing the darkness. We want answers, don't we? We want answers, and the more that you go for those answers, there seems to be this absence of answers. Uh, I made an episode that was, I think, the, the threshold of belief, I think is what I called it. Something in threshold is in the name. But my episode about that was simply this. <clears throat> when you try to conceive of space as a human being, I think this is my space episode too, there seems to be a cosmic pressure that pushes back on your attempt to push your consciousness out to that level and conceive of what's out there. It's this bizarre, almost pre-programming in the human mind that goes, nah, you're not going there. It's, it's uh, in, a, in a movie, in a romantic way, it might be a character's voice saying, you can't conceive of what you're trying to conceive of. So it's best that you don't try. At no point where your hum human mind, with the amount of cells you got access to and your cosmic nature through your third eye, the pineal gland, you're not going to be able to conceive in this particular form, nor are you supposed to conceive of this stuff. We have built a wonderful world that if you just relax, if you just pull back from some of these infinity concepts, you're going to live a much better life. And, but, okay... So let's say you've seen that in your brain at one point in time. You might simply say, but why did you give me the curiosity in the first place without a governor inside me, right? If we're not supposed to think about certain things because it will be sort of the snake eating its own tail, right? Where insanity and, I don't know, idiocy is, is just hand in hand, right? Or what is it? No, genius and insanity, excuse me, is hand in hand. You start conceiving of too much. And you get to a point where you're seeing just static in your brain. Nothing's ever going to be a picture of Mona Lisa. You know, those of you kids that don't remember, back in the 80s, if you see the movie Poltergeist, you'll see an example of this in 1982. The kids looking at the screen on the TV and at midnight, they play the national anthem, little montage of patriotic images. And then the channel would turn itself off and your TV would be static. And you could fall asleep in your living room watching TV and wake up and your TV's got static on it, right? Unimportant to what I'm saying, but the static will never be the Mona Lisa, right? It won't. And I, a lot of you would turn down the volume if you're like me as a little kid. And you'd stare at that static and you just see these swimming little particles and you would kind of have a hard time even conceiving of what's making static? Why is it static? Why isn't it just a black screen? You know, what, what's static in the first place? Very weird thing, right? You just have to do with the antenna just picking up ambient radiation or something and broadcasting it through your television. I don't know. Still is bizarre. That might just be a visual metaphor for us pushing ourselves beyond where we're supposed to push ourselves. When you think about the sphere of influence I keep talking about, there's just, it's such a simple place, isn't it? You know, I always tell you, think about, you know, maybe a 10 foot radius from your chest that goes all the way around your body in a sphere. And that's really a good, super important place that you need to take care of, right? It keeps you safe. It keeps you healthy. It keeps you happy. And if we start pushing our consciousness infinitely past this, this, this sphere of influence, well, it starts to beg the question of what is what is so important past the sphere of influence that you need to pay attention to it? You could expand that thing to a mile and still beyond that, you know, do you really need to worry about everything that's going on in the world? Yes, there was a flood there and there's a fire there. And what are you going to do? What are you going to you know, bucket all the water out of a town and make sure it doesn't flood again? I mean, you can't. You can only pick a better place to live where it doesn't flood. Play the odds with the weather, you know. But if you just take care of you, 
the beautiful things can happen. I think you feel me. I wanted to beat up this thing for quite a while because, again, it's becoming uh, something that people are talking about a lot. I never got to say another word to the two girls that were, one was ringing up my groceries and the other one was packing them. But I would have loved to say, hey, can I meet you guys for coffee and just pick your brain about what you think the matrix is. But I run the risk of, one, seem like a weirdo, but two, they haven't thought about it beyond the basics of, hey man, there's just something out there that seems strange. And so it's good to talk about it. Try to find someone in your life. If this, if any subject like this occupies a tremendous amount of your brain timetable, find someone to talk to. Use the comments of any one of our social media things to talk to other people. Read other people's comments. Don't just write your own. Write your own and get into other people's and be nice to each other and just say, you know, it's funny you say that because this, this, and this. What do you think about that? And just, just start creating a thread in there, you know? You, I mean, if you can find human beings in the real world, that's the best, right? Pose, pose the question to somebody. If they don't have it in them, don't try to push them because you'll just get more frustrated with the fact that your brain is on a different level than theirs in this particular area of thought. But I'm willing to bet the universe will provide you with someone that will absolutely be able to go toe to toe with the concepts you're bringing and try to go older. If you're younger, go older. And that way you're talking to someone that might have 10 more years than you have. But don't sell short to younger people too, because they could have been thinking about this since they were 15. Now they're 30 and they got 15 years of this and you've been on this for maybe five years. Man, they can jumpstart your brain a little higher in the concepts. You might be the next one to find what the matrix is, you know, or more cause and effect models of how to live in it. Anyway. If you haven't been to deepthoughtsradio.com, please go. The website's pretty tuned up. I've moved the whole thing to a really fast server. I think most of you will notice that the MP3s come down super fast for your podcasts. GoDaddy has nothing to do with this anymore. So that's good. We have audio for those of you coming on video. Video for those of you who come on audio. There's a store up there with really cool shirts. They're now priced properly. So the smaller you are, the slightly cheaper they are, the bigger you are, I actually have better better um, options for up to X, uh, was it five, triple X, five, five X, whatever it is. Um, but also rely on the search engine. I'm getting a lot of folks and I love it when this happens. They'll make, hey man, you should do a movie, you should use the episode on They Live. I already done it. But if you go to the website and just go to the search field, type in they and you'll find it or go to the movie section and you'll find it. There's a whole category on the matrix. So just understand you can get all kinds of cool episodes on everything that you like and just ignore everything else you don't like. That's how life works, right? This show is way too diverse. If you guys like every single episode, I'd be shocked. And there are some of you. But for those of you who like everything, there's t-shirts for you up there, right? Get the 2015 Deep Thoughts University shirt because that's for you. Anyway, to the Patreon, PayPal folks, thank you so much. You make it happen. Take care of yourself and someone else. And I'll see you on the next Deep Thoughts. Over and out.